The War of the Wells by H.G. Wells. Chapter 8 Friday Night. The most extraordinary thing to my mind of all the strange or wonderful things that happened upon that Friday was the dovetailing of the commonplace habits of our social order with the first beginning of a series of events that was to topple that social order headlong. If on Friday night you'd taken a pair of compass, drawn a circle with a radius of five miles around Wilking fan pits, I doubt if you would have one human being outside it, unless it was some relation to stent or the three of a four cyclists, or London people, lying dead on the common, whose emotions or habits all were at all affected by the newcomers. Many people had heard of the seminar, of course, and talked about it in their leisure. It certainly did not make the sensation that an ultimatum to Germany would have done. In London that night, Paul Henderson's giant telegram, describing the gradual unscrewing of the shot, was judged to be carnid. His evening paper, before worrying for authentication from him receiving no reply, the man was killed. So I did not print a special edition. Even within the five mile circle, the great majority of people were inert. I have already described the behaviour of the men and women of whom I spoke. All over the district, people were dying and supping. Working men were guarding above the labours of the day. Of the labours of the day, children being put to bed, young people were wandering through the lanes, love making students sat over their books. Maybe there was a murmur in the village streets, a novel, a dominant topic in the public houses, here and there, and a messenger, even an eyewitness and lateral occurrences, caused a well of excitement and shouting, running to and fro. But for the most part, the daily routine of working, eating, drinking, sleeping went on had done for countless years. Though no planet Mars existed in the sky, even a welcome station holds well, and Chobham, that was it the case. A welcome junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on, others were shunting on the sidings, passengers were lighting and waiting, everything was proceeding in the most ordinary way, Boy for the town, trenching on Smith's monopoly, was selling papers to the the afternoon view news, being impacted with trucks and sharp whistle of the engines from the junction, mingled with their shouts of men for Mars. So the men came into the station about nine o'clock. Incredible tidings had caused no more disturbance than drunken might have done. People ran into London words, peered in the darkness outside the carriage windows, saw only a rare flickering vanishing spark dance up from the direction of holes where it fell, a red glow and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars, but nothing more serious than heath fire was happening. It was only round the edge of the common any disturbance were perceivable. There was a half a dozen villas burning on the broken boulder. There were lights in all the houses on the common side of the three villages, the people there kept awake till dawn. Crew's crowd lung lingered restlessly, people coming and going, the crowd remaining both for the trop, trop, Copham and Hillswell bridges. One or two adventurous souls, is afterwards found, went to the darkness and crawled quite near the Martians, but they never returned for now and again. A light ray like the beam of warship's spot searchlight swept the common, heat waves ready to follow. Save as such, the big area of commotion was silent. The big area of the common was silent and desolate. The child bodies lay about on it all night under the stars all the next day. A noise of hammering for the pit was heard by many people. So you have the state of things on Friday night, and the centre sticking into the skin of our old, our old planet Earth, like a poison dart was his cylinder, but the poison was scarcely working yet. Round it was a patch of silent common, smouldering in places, a few dark, dimly seen objects, lying confronted attitudes here and there. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. Beyond was a fringe of excitement, a further than the fringe of formation. They had not crept as yet. The rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed as that had flowed for memorable years. Fever that war, 
that would presently clog vein and artery, deaden nerve and destroy brain, had still to develop. All night long the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless, indefragable, at work upon machines, and making ready, and ever again the puff, greenish-white smoke whirled up on the, to the starlit sky. About eleven, a company of soldiers came through Holsham, deployed along the edge of the common to form a cauldron. Later, a second company marched through Cobham, deployed on the other side of the common. Several officers from the Inkerman barracks been on the common early in the day, and one Major L. Eden reported to be missing. The Colonel of the Regiment came to Cob- Cobham Bridge and was busy questioning the crowd at midnight. The British authorities were suddenly alive to the seriousness of the business. By eleven, the next morning's papers they would say a squadron of high sirs, two maximums, about four hundred men of the Cardigan Regiment startled started from out of older shop. A few seconds after midnight, a crowd in Chelsea Road, woking, saw a star fall from the heaven, the pine woods to northwest. It had a greenish colour and caused a sudden brightness like summer lightning. This was the second cylinder. <laughs>